so today I'm going to talk about how we use React Native at ease and how the technology of React Native addresses some of the issues uh, and challenges that are pretty unique to a cannabis startup. So over at Ease, we have two mobile apps. One is the app which drivers use to facilitate their deliveries, and the other is the consumer app that's available in the app stores. So why did we decide to use React Native in the first place? Well, before I joined, we had no employed app developers. We had one full-time iOS contractor, actually Harry Tormey, who's speaking tomorrow. We had one very, very part-time Android contractor, but we did have a sizable front-end team all on React.js. Then I joined the team, and now we also had one full-time Android developer. So we had a few questions to address. First off, can Ease even get into the App Store? We wanted to spin up a cross-platform experience pretty quickly, just a really basic sign-up flow and see, can we get into the App Store, and then iterate on that and see what features they let us add. <laughs> In addition, we wanted to be able to share resources, meaning people, with our sizable front-end team, which is on React.js, and it'd be really great if we could also share code with web. So last year, the state of React Native at ease, we had two greenfield, fully React Native apps. We had our driver app and our consumer app, both cross-platform, single repo, greenfield, React Native. Uh, since then, we've grown our mobile team. It's now four people, you could say a quartet. We have two full-time Android developers and two full-time iOS devs. As, since then, the current state of React Native at Ease has changed a bit. The driver app is still that cross-platform single repo Greenfield app, but the consumer app has diverged their code bases. The iOS app has decided to stay on React Native, and in the Android app, we moved over to Kotlin. I'll talk about that uh, a bit more later on. So we have some pretty big wins in the driver app from React Native. Uh, first off, it's maintainable by the entire team. Uh, now most companies have a fairly static product roadmap that's planned up very far in advance and doesn't change all of a sudden, and this is largely a factor of them not selling marijuana. Um, <laughs> so the legal landscape concerning marijuana um, it's very, very dynamic, it changes all the time, and it's extremely fragmented from city to city. So, for example, the, state, uh, the city of San Jose in California all of a sudden introduced this regulation that the drivers would have to scan the customer's driver's license upon them accepting their delivery and collect a signature in the app. So all of a sudden, someone from the mobile team has to stop whatever they're doing and change the way that the driver app works. Um, with well, a mobile team of only four developers, if we had two uh, repositories, one for each platform, it'd be very inconvenient to have to pull 50% of the mobile team off whatever they were doing to drop everything and work on the driver app. So it's really great to have that single repo. Number two, it is an ideal learning opportunity for React Native, and I say that because we are paying the drivers to use the app. Um, if they don't like something or something goes wrong, they don't just leave you a one-star review in the app store and uninstall it. They call operations, we find out what's wrong. Um, if there's a problem, we can even go out there, look at their phone, and debug it. So it's a really great opportunity just in terms of a testing ground, and it's a, a bit lower risk overall. Um, code push is an absolute game changer for us, and that's because the driver app is not in the app store. Uh, we, they sideload it onto their devices. We do not want to put it in the app store. We have a bit of a funny relationship with them. Sometimes we add a feature and they decide they don't like it. We have to change stuff. So um, having some mechanism for, uh, yeah, anyway, so having some kind of mechanism for over-the-air code updates uh, is really great when we don't have an update mechanism uh, that's traditional in terms of the app store. Uh, we do have a couple of pitfalls. Number one, we do still need to have native libraries that we created. Um, the JavaScript bridge is not particularly resilient to long-running background processes, so we had to create some native libraries to accommodate that. Uh, we have about five repos that we maintain, and we really wish that it could just be 100% React Native. And then the other issue is that stack traces are pretty difficult to understand. Sometimes there's a problem with the app. Uh, the drivers aren't always the most technical people in describing to us what went wrong. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to decipher when we just look at Crashlytics. Uh, if you want to learn more about the native apps that, or the native modules that are in our driver app, you could check out a Chain React talk from last year uh, by Harry Tormey. So in the iOS team, on their consumer app, they decided to stay on React Native despite it not being a cross-platform solution. Uh, 
So why do they like it so much? First off, they love that they no longer have to support Android, especially Android's uh, device fragmentation. They don't have to worry about supporting these very, very old Android devices, uh, and they can have more iOS-specific UX design patterns. They love that they could share code with web. They love the development speed of hot reload. Uh, they really like the open source community that surrounds React Native, that uh, there's a culture of using other libraries as opposed to the not invented here syndrome that you tend to get in the iOS community. And they also had some pretty negative experiences with Objective-C and Swift. So React Native provided a really attractive alternative as opposed to something uh, that Google decided to start officially supporting Kotlin, which provides a really nice developer experience on Android. Uh, so on the Android side, we did decide to move over to Kotlin. But when we created that repo, I thought, what about making this a hybrid app? What would it take for me to put React Native into this Kotlin app? Uh, the number one thing for me would be better tooling and build automation. So right now, even if I was to introduce a very small experimental feature written in React Native into our Kotlin app, I have build automation, continuous integration tests, UI testing, unit testing, and all of that would have to be fixed as soon as I introduce even a small feature. And I haven't been able to yet justify that velocity hit. So better tooling in React Native uh, would be a huge reason why I would, uh, that, that would cause me to introduce it again. Uh, the other aspect that I haven't heard discussed that much is an improved bundler. And I wondered, is there an engineering pattern that we could use to eliminate these tooling problems? So when you integrate React Native into an existing native app, um, it's a little complicated, it's not exactly straightforward, but it, it's pretty well documented and you can do it. But it's nowhere near as easy as integrating a native library into a native app. Uh, you build your native library into what's called an AAR file, it's an Android archive file. Uh, it's a library, you add a single line of code to your Gradle build file, and it really does just work. And I wondered, can you get the ease of a native AAR file, but use React Native inside of it? So if you look at these smallest three dolls, that represents the uh, typical integration of React Native into a native app. And I thought, what if you were to just build that into, instead of ma making that your app, um, you build it into a native AAR then you have these native to native module bindings. React Native just lives in its own ecosystem inside that AAR file. The native app doesn't have to know about React Native. It doesn't have to care about React Native. It may not even be aware that React Native is used in that library and it could just work. Uh, so I tried this. Um, it works really well as long as you do not have any uh, third party libraries in your JavaScript code. And that's where the bundler uh, for React Native just doesn't work. I did get it to work. If you don't use any NPM modules, it does work great. Um, you can see that your native app is saying hello world because that's about all you can do in JavaScript without third-party libraries. <laughs> and then uh, number three would be a synchronous bridge. Uh, so the current state of React Native is that the bridge is asynchronous. That's the only way that you can communicate between the native and JavaScript layers. So that makes it pretty complicated, even if you just have a simple function that you want to call in order to communicate between the two. Uh, this is an overview of the process. If you want to learn more about the nitty gritty technical details, you can look up uh, my talk on YouTube from Reactathon 2018, sharing code between React and React Native. It's just a lightning talk, so I won't get into it now. Uh, but Facebook did announce that they are working on a large scale rearchitecture and that we might be able to expect uh, a synchronous bridge. And you can see our ease model here is smiling and happy just thinking about the possibilities of a synchronous bridge. <laughs> okay, so that concludes my talk. Uh, feel free to come up to me after if you have any questions or find me on Twitter. And thanks so much for having me.